Hey guys, we're on our way back from visiting the mountains with family and we figured we are trapped here in the car. We might as well film a Q&A and we are here to answer them in this little vlog style Q&A. Ask Pastor Joe. How do we truly know we are saved? I'm curious about Pastor Joe's journey of faith. Any advice for young people interested in pursuing ministry and spreading the gospel? Saved by Grace said best place to start for new adult believers. I feel like I'm a lifetime behind. I would say start in the Gospels, then the letters, like to the churches. Start with like Ephesians because that's a letter to like all the churches. And I would say like Galatians or Romans would be up there. Although Romans is hard to read. I don't know, Joe, what do you say? If you're not as familiar with the Gospels, I would start in John because there's like plainness to it and central focus on salvation and eternal life and definitely like Genesis. So wait, if we were to write like a quick Bible reading list for a new believer, start with John, start with chapter one of John, then jump over to Genesis one through three, maybe four through 11 of Genesis, then go and finish John. Well, then why don't you jump over to Ephesians, Galatians, Romans, jump back over to finish the, all the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then maybe read like the Thessalonians. James, you gotta throw James in there somewhere. That's a really good one from early believers. Maybe put that right behind Ephesians. <laughs> there, there you go, that should get you started. You wanna talk about election? What's the question? C. Kizzy says, hi Faith and Joe, I really struggle with the doctrine of election. I'm afraid I'm not elect, what should I do? If you are saved, if you are a believer, then you are elect. And if you're not a believer, you can still be elect. Your time just hasn't come yet, so. This is a huge discussion and cannot be possibly covered in one video. But yeah, just to dive in a little bit. Yeah, you're not gonna be a believer saved and, and not be elected. That's not issue. So if I was to do a broad oversimplification here, we've got Calvinists and we got Arminians. Calvinists under Calvin would say that God has predestined or elected believers before the beginning of time, those who will be saved. Arminians are those who would say, yes, but I chose to pray the prayer of salvation. Yes, God is sovereign, God knows all things, but I also received him, I walked down the aisle. Calvins and Arminians could probably just pick apart that wording. Either way, the more you study this, the more you see Calvins and Arminians define themselves and each other in very different ways that don't always line up. I love to push Joseph's buttons because while he is a Calvinist, sometimes I'm like, that's a little bit of Arminian language, Joseph. And the opposite is true as well. But Joseph, how would you define election? Because clearly this person heard from a Calvinist, only the elect are saved. God, before the foundation of the world, saved some or saved many. And it's the idea, the perspective that we all deserve hell. We all deserve death. But God in his infinite grace and mercy died on the cross for our sins and gathered a people for himself. So all throughout the Bible, we it sees like a Israel of, of God's people and that continues through the church today and so God has his people his elect and it's the ones who he chooses now in practicality and sharing the gospel and telling people about Jesus you do so like that's what we're called to do so we continue to do that it's based off of that God calls you to himself or God comes down to you and draws you to himself which is biblical language as is predestination but God's elect is God takes the action brings you in versus it's your decision to be saved and that's common language to decide to be saved making decision for salvation but the view of election is that you can't choose your way that you are dead in your trespasses and sins and if the choice is left up to you you would choose sin every time is it so crazy to say that if someone wants to be the elect then they are the elect like what would a Calvinist say to that if I was to say pastor if someone wants to be the elect then they are the elect right pastor Joe yeah, in a certain sense, or if you like are professing Christian, if you repent of your sins and trust in Jesus, then you are the elect. There's no such thing as like, I want to be the elect, but I don't know if I am. If you're gonna like, use that election language. No, no, yeah, yeah, it's, it's still a legitimate question, but I don't think that you need to fret because the Lord is gracious and loving and saving. So you are pleading out for salvation. He's not gonna say, mm, no, I didn't choose you before the world. <laughs> He's like, yes, my child, come home. Okay, let's keep going. This is a funner question. What do you believe about the giants and Nephilim? All right, so this stuff is super interesting to me and sometimes in my free time, I'll listen to some Bigfoot podcasts and that sort of thing. And not to say that I'm a believer, but to say that it just interests me. A lot of people have the theory that Bigfoot is a branch off of the Nephilim and their impact, like a lot of the people 
who believe the Bible and have claimed to have seen Bigfoot will most likely hold to this view most of the time. On that standpoint, that's what I've heard recently about the Nephilim and giants and that sort of thing. But we're really given like one verse, I think it's mentioned like in one other place as well. That's all we get about the Nephilim. Joseph wasn't listening in his seminary lectures like I was. <laughs> If you're watching this video still, comment down below and let's give Joseph a hard time again because we love to give him a hard time, don't we? Everyone say, Leonardo, please, uh, please cut <laughs> what I said before, please. Everyone say, oh, Joseph. Yeah, everyone say, oh, Joseph. Okay. So one of my seminary professors argues that there's a connection with the Nephilim with Saul. So the Nephilim in Genesis 6, verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days sons of God came to the daughters of man and they bore children to them. Here, Genesis 6, before the flood, there are daughters of man and the sons of God bearing children called the Nephilim. Let me connect some dots here. There's four different ways to view the sons of God. Meredith Klein wrote The Cult of the Divine Kings and it's a lot like how the Pharaoh was viewed as a god. They claimed deity and therefore it's a perverse leadership claiming godhood. It's not really the sons of God. Number two is the sons of God equal a godly line, sons of Seth. But the daughters of men are the bloodline of Cain. So pagans are corrupt and they're making babies with the God's people. Then the third option is they are angelic beings. Job 1 mentions sons of God, like fallen angels, impregnating humans, creating superhumans. And then fourth, these are fallen angels which took over human kings and leaders and through their perverse leadership took dominion over the earth. So ultimately, this is one of the great mysteries of scripture and it's really fun to wrestle with as long as we hold to biblical inerrancy and that like, no matter what, this doesn't shape my faith in the cross and in Jesus. Ultimately, it gives us a fuller understanding of culture and view of God's and man's and God's people versus the pagan culture and how it, I don't know. And so there were obviously giants like in the biblical times, obviously Goliath and shocked about Goliath. They just said he was a giant. And they seem to be there before the flood. It's fun to wrestle through these things. Again, it's super fascinating to me, but I don't have the answers. I said it before here on my channel, but if we understood everything about God, he wouldn't be God. That's part of the glory and the awesomeness of trusting in God is not trying to understand everything about him and his story. But it's really cool when we get snippets like this that reflect some piece of culture or history that we don't quite understand. We live in a very scientific age, so we want proof. We want proof texts. We want an explanation for everything. What do they mean by sons of God? What do they mean by the Nephilim? There seems to be some kind of connections, but we don't really have to know the answers. We can sometimes just say, wow, God, this is really cool. What's the takeaway though? What would the first authors and audiences understood about this? Well, that God's people are set apart, that they're protected even against giants. We had some people run up to us in church a couple Sundays ago and they were like, so where did Cain get his wife? I tend to be more, what if she was there? Like, <laughs> does she have to be a sister? Like, I tend to be a little bit more libertine with that kind of stuff of like, Genesis seems to use a lot of ancient Near Eastern storytelling methods. It doesn't take away its authoritative like inerrancy. It's just a different way of reading Genesis. Do we read it as like, this is a scientific textbook or are we reading this as, this is a theological history. So this is a theological interpretation of this history that happened. And so they're gonna leave out some character or they're gonna include other characters they're gonna you know point out the themes and the, and the metaphors that they want you to see because it's not just a unbiased historical telling it got a storyline to it I'm like maybe it was his sister maybe it wasn't even if it wasn't his sister that doesn't challenge the trustworthiness of the scriptures it's just oh there were other people there too and the historical narrative didn't find it necessary to include it but Joe would say oh, that's a little bit too crazy I would say it's his sister wouldn't you well I think so yeah I would say like Adam and Eve have such a like broad gene pool because of their creativeness and how different people are today. And so I think that there was like room for it then, obviously not room for it now. I think either way we have to look at what is the theological takeaway and less about I need to have a scientific understanding of everything that it's describing here. Because again, we're just kind of misusing the scriptures for why they were written. Were they written to explain how humanity got to making babies and having enough genes for everybody? Or were they written so that we have a theological understanding of who we are and why we exist and who God is. I would say it's the latter, but when we get caught up in who's Cain's wife, sometimes we're getting a little bit too, I must find an answer. Therefore, Adam and Eve must just have enough good genes where it's okay. And it's like, it doesn't matter. That's where I'm coming from. Does that make sense? Yep.
I don't know. But I think this is one of my favorite parts about our marriage is that we don't have the exact same answers for stuff and we can still be married. And I think that's how the church should really be of like, hey, he'd probably be a little bit more conservative on his answer on this topic. I would probably be a little bit more libertine and be like, it doesn't really matter. But either way, God is still bigger than both those answers and we can still worship the same God together. <laughs> okay, Alex King asked, why is Pastor Joe bald? Laugh out loud. Four-year-old asks this every single day of his life. And yesterday I broke him the news that he's probably gonna be bald one day. And he said, no, I don't wanna be bald. And so we prayed about it and we talked to God about his feelings about baldness. Yes, so I am bald because I was naturally going bald. My dad is bald, my grandfather's bald, all the uncles on both sides of my family are bald. So I kind of just knew that it would happen to me. Once my hairline started going back, I was like, you know what? I can't take this. I don't want to hold on to something that's not going to be held on to. So I did a dramatic shave the whole thing. One time I remember distinctively, I was doing like a video and I put my head down and I saw like how far back my hairline was going. When I watched the video and so I was like, Faith, it's time. And we did we it. Shaved it all off and haven't looked back ever ever since. And sometimes I sort of question, you know, my decision and that sort of thing. But then I feel like feel back to where my hairline is and it's further back than it was even already. And so I'm glad I went ahead and did it. I've always enjoyed the Mr. Clean look. I think it's just easy too. You just shave it off and you don't worry about hair gel or anything like that. Now we can never address enough of these questions. There's so many to get to and I just couldn't get to all of them. Thank you guys for submitting them. Make sure that you're following me on Instagram right here because that is where I got some of these questions or a lot of them actually. But if you guys liked us bouncing back and forth and kind of teaching together, then you might like our Romans course where Doe and I both teach on the theology and the richness there in the book of Romans. You can find that right here or if you'd like to see our video where we also do some more Q&As, check out this video here. And I'll see you guys in this video or this link. Bye guys.